coming up. Like 49.58% of people have a vagina. So we're going to talk about it. <laughs> That's right. Yes. I just say it. No vagina, you know, falls behind or stay behind. <laughs> we're just going to help everyone. The prolapse, it's when we have our internal organs coming down into the vaginal canal. Uh, it could be either the bladder, the uterus, or sometimes the rectum will come into the vaginal area. So some of it, funny enough, is it could be the tightness into the pelvic floor. So pelvic floor muscles are, a, it looks like a hammock. It looks like a bowl at the bottom of your pelvis that mm. support your internal organ. So if these muscles are tight, then they can generate enough force to support those organs. And that will cause um, what I call it, it's just a tension weakness cycle. So the tightness in the muscle will cause the weakness in the system and things start coming down because the muscles are not really doing what they're supposed to do. Pelvic floor has three layers. The first one, which is the most outer layer, that's responsible for um, sexual function and continence. Mm -hmm. A lot of time, this first layer could be the cause any spasm, lack of mobility, lack of flexibility in these muscles could cause pain with intercourse. Like you said, that initial um, penetration could be painful because this first layer of muscles are being tight and tense and spasm. Or we also have the second and third layer into a pelvic floor that are deeper into the muscle. So people who, call, who have pain with deep penetration, maybe these layer of muscles are uh, dysfunctional. So when you get tight neck muscle, you have trigger points, you have, um, I don't know, knot in your muscle. These muscle also could have um, trigger points or have a knot in these muscle, lack of mobility, lack of uh, flexibility that could be causing the pain with intercourse. There's a reason for it. So they just, they just need to find a reason and treat it. And then they're going to have the best time of their life with their partner. I don't know when people say, no, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Not having it. It's like, girl, you don't know what you're missing out. Okay. No. <laughs> so don't give up on this. We want to invite you to the first annual Munch Bunch Wellness and Rejuvenation Retreat in the Dominican Republic, November 9th through the 12th, 2023. It will be an all-inclusive retreat meant to refuel you, give you a chance to rest, relax, and network with others in our Munch Bunch family. We will also be talking about ways to get out of your own way so you can live your dreams, build your business, and do what you need to do. So check it out. The link is in the description, and the dates are November 9th through the 12th. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Munch Bunch podcast. This is Kimi Nishimoto and Megan Vanoy. Hello. Mm -hmm. And today we have Dr. Linda Sayad. You might know her on Instagram as the V Doc or the Vagina Doc. And she is a pelvic floor PT in California. Um, Dr. Linda, do you want to give us just a little intro about you and then we'll pull our affirmator for today? Sure. First, I just want to say hello to everyone. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Uh, like you said, my name is Dr. Linda Sayad. I'm from Feminocentric Physical Therapy. And on Instagram, everybody knows me as the vagina doctor. And um, I specifically work with women, especially during pregnancy, postpartum. Somehow that became my niche. Although we treat um, all women in any stage of their life. And just recently, we added pediatric. Uh, but yes, for the past three years, my focus been uh, mostly pregnancy, postpartum, um, taking care of their pelvic floor, any needs from um, bowel and bladder, sexual dysfunction, and anything women health related, you name it, we treat. So important. So, so, mm -hmm. so important. Yes, yes. If you guys, I think I've talked about it before, but if not, um, you know, ever since I've had Isabel, I have been um, and different working on different things with my pelvic floor physical therapist up here in Portland. So big fan, 
big fan of uh, pelvic floor PT up here. So <laughs> happy to hear that. Oh. Everyone should receive pelvic floor physical therapy rehabilitation during and after preventative mm -hmm. and rehabilitation. That's a big, big, big part of any pregnancy postpartum journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is not, not talked about enough. So, but before we do, because we'll probably, we'll, we'll really dive into it here in a second. Um, we are going to set our intention for the episode. And so we are going to have you pick out our munchy Monday affirmator. So I'm going to shuffle and kind of go through them and you tell me when to stop. So. All Love right. it. All right. Ready? Here we go. Go. Stop. Oh, she's on it. Like that was fast. I love it. <laughs> the top ones are just as good. <laughs> no time to waste. Let it go. I love it. Okay. I love it. All right. Imperfection. So Ooh. today I embrace the Japanese ideal of wabi sabi, aka the perfection of imperfection. Bless my messes. Bless my mistakes and my oops. That wasn't supposed to be a lion but it looks like a drunken raccoon. A uh, perfect <laughs> plan can only be so interesting. So thanks, happy accidents for shaking things up and leading me on unplanned adventures. I'll pay you 10% when my drunken raccoon stationary business takes off. And it's this little. Wonderful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think that's just like so true, right? Like we always talk about perfectionism. And like how it really truly is like probably our biggest number one enemy. And, you know, if Kimmy and I tried to make this podcast perfect when we first started, um, right. we probably would have never started. So <laughs> yes. sometimes you just got to dive in and be imperfect in, in that space. So, you know, now we've got the hang of it most of the time, but we still have our, our days and our moments. So, um, you know, let, we'll let that kind of sit in with you guys this week. And then talk to Dr. Linda more about what she does and how she got into it. And I definitely want to talk about the pediatric stuff today, too, because I think that's something that never gets talked about, um, that there's, you know, like pediatric pelvic floor specialists, um, especially with kids who, you know, have just overall dysfunctions. And so, you know, wetting their pants or leakage during the day and those kind of things. So I'm super, super excited to learn even more. So how yeah. did you, uh, how did you end up in this field? Well, a uh, funny story. When I was in physical therapy school, we had one class on pelvic floor and I said, ew, I am not doing this. <laughs> and it's so funny that I said, I cannot even touch my own vagina, yet alone <laughs> touching someone else's vagina. This is not for me. There's going to be two questions from this part and so be it. I'm just going to guess and moved on. And then a couple of years after that, I got pregnant with my first baby and um, I encountered some conditions and issues that they call normal with pregnancy, but normal, honestly, it's not normal, it's just common. And anytime I went to my doctor and they said, well, it's normal, welcome to pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Then I started having some bleeding issue and they, they put me on bed rest and told me don't do anything and then a couple of weeks later it's like now you can do everything and that was just so confusing to me and not having a guideline of what do you mean don't do anything now do everything um so pregnancy went by and then I had my first child ended up with a c-section um and six weeks I was doing so well that the doctor discharged me didn't even kept me for eight weeks that normal eight weeks postpartum uh, and he said, go back to normal. And obviously, um, I was a PT and I felt like I should know how to treat this body postpartum, but I did not know anything. Mm -hmm. And when the doctor says, go back to normal first child, the society puts that pressure of, Oh, when are you going to start exercising? Or when are you going to start working on your postpartum body? Um, you know, lose that baby weight. And, um, so I went ahead and I signed up for a mommy boot camp eight weeks post C-section. <laughs> and I encountered a lot of issue myself. And that was a start point for me that if I'm a, actually a physical therapist and I don't know how to take care of myself, then how could anyone else get through this phase without any guideline? And <laughs> um, 
So um, I started looking more into it and um, taking more courses. And this, because I was going through this issue, all of a sudden I was very interested in the topic. This time around, it was not you. It was like, oh, fascinating. <laughs> oh, yes, I wish I did that classes or I wish I prepped my pelvis floor. Maybe I would have get the birth that I wanted it. Obviously, every birth is perfect. And every birth is um, the way of bringing this human to the world. There is nothing superior to the other way of giving birth. But at the time, you know, when you postpartum, things are not clear. You're a little bit, you know, foggy on your head, but all the postpartum stuff. Anyhow, I started training and I really enjoyed learning about public four. Then I got pregnant with my second one and this training experimenting things on myself kept going and going and then um I just felt the need for this population I felt my heart broke for moms that they did not know what to do and they were told that hey this is just part of pregnancy this is just part of the postpartum welcome to the motherhood the up oh, yeah I leaked too my mom did leak too oh she had just had a surgery for a prolapse and I just knew we can do better and we deserve better so uh, when I was ready to go back to work, I told my husband, I don't think I want to go back to work. I'm just going to resign and I'm going to do my own thing. Hmm. And that's how feminocentric, woman centric came about. And I wanted to have a center, the summer safe for moms during pregnancy, postpartum, postmenopausal. I mean, postpartum is forever. It doesn't matter if you just had a baby or you are 60, 70 years old, postpartum is forever. So I just decided hmm. to dedicate my career and to woman health and make sure we get the treatment, the support uh, that we need. And I wanted to create a safe place somewhere that people could be vulnerable, talk about their issue, the leaking, the prolapse, pain with intercourse, and nothing is TMI in my, in, in my center. So we talk about everything. And yeah, three years later, um, we are here and serving a lot of women in our community. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. I love how yeah. you went from, I'm not touching that. I'm not going there. That's nasty to like, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to change my whole career and focus oh, on yeah. this population. And I think that's when things are the most powerful as a provider is when you mm -hmm. know what it's like. And so then you can help guide people through that process. You can hold their hand through it and go through it together. Yes. I mean, we have a lot of patients that when they are done with us, they come back with another condition. Like we create, we created a community for women in here that everybody feels safe and we're a friend. We have our uh, support system. So it's like, hey girl, you're done, bye-bye. But everybody just loves coming back with different, you know, oh, okay, I now I just wanna work on my conditioning. Now I just wanna work on this. So um, yes, it, it's it's been a, great journey for me like you said going from I don't want to deal with this now it's my passion it's something that I live and breathe every day mm -hmm. <laughs> living and yeah. breathing a vagina is pretty intense <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it gives me joy <laughs> oh well and I would not survive without the pelvic floor field so like thank you I um you know my personal story I felt really pressured. Well, and I was very much pressured to go back to, um, to work like three weeks after Izzy was born. And like, I had some retained placenta and that I like almost bled out at five weeks postpartum. And then, um, I tried to go back to like normal and start playing softball at like seven weeks postpartum and, uh, would not recommend to anybody, by the way, who's listening but I had so many sciatica, like just constant sciatica issues for, and I still struggle with it. I, again, I'm working with my own amazing pelvic floor PT up, up here in Portland. We do a lot of myofascial release type stuff, but, um, you know, it was like every four to six weeks I would have a sciatica flare and I couldn't like carry my own child. And it took, you know, I went through three different pelvic floor specialists to find somebody that like is the right fit for me. And, you know, it's crazy to me. And I wish I would have realized sooner to do pelvic PT before my daughter was born, but <laughs> so grateful for afterwards because it's been, you know, it's been really hard. It's been such a journey and, you know, not being able to pick up your own child because like, you know, you have such bad pain is like 
also traumatizing as a as a new mom trying to do it all so um, I love that like from your own experience that's where you that's where you went to yes I mean and like you said we have a lot of women come to our office and say I wish I knew you guys existed I wish we knew there was you know pelvic floor physical therapy and that's honestly my mission that's a mission that it's bigger than feminocentric it's bigger than Pasadena and I'm just wanting to take this everywhere I go and be like, hey, did you know about your pelvic floor? So that's my biggest, biggest mission of just making sure every woman on this planet in my power knows their pelvic floor and there is treatment for it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Love that. Love that gives me chills. Well, and that's kind of like us, right, Kimmy? Like mm -hmm. we want like so many, we get, get told that all the time about my functional therapy. I didn't know this existed. I didn't know there was a thing for this. I didn't know, like, why is this the first time I'm hearing about this, right? And so that's been our mission. And that's why we started a podcast because that was our mission is to get the word out about myofunctional therapy and, you know, let people know they can be helped in all sorts of different ways. So mm -hmm. our missions are very in alignment with what, we, yes. what we're passionate about. <laughs> let's, let's, I don't know, do whatever we can in our power. So I just say it, no vagina, you know, falls behind or stay behind. <laughs> we're just going to help everyone with a in my, you know, specialty, I'm just doing women, men have pelvic floor too. Um, and, uh, but, you know, you know, what I'm doing right now is only woman centered, but uh, everybody without pelvic floor, they need to mm -hmm. at least have some sort of assessment at some point in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. I was looking up the statistics of like women and men, because I was like, is it 50% or is it off? It's actually 49.58. So pretty close. Okay. So at first I, I was kind of shy to do this episode. I'm like, Oh, what if people are like, that's, that's a funny thing to talk about. But I was like, you know what guys, like 49.58% of people have a vagina. So we're going to talk about it. <laughs> that's right. Yes. That's true. That's true. They're out there. Uh, we want to introduce this spot for tots course, a parent's guide for toddlers ages two to five for mini Mayo. We have Megan and Kimmy going over nasal hygiene, myofunctional exercises, breathing exercises, tongue tie healing protocols, and then we have Jenny June going over sleep hygiene, and Kelsey Baker going over feeding therapy and body work. Uh, the course is two ninety seven, and the link will be in the description. Um, so, talk to us a little bit too about like little kids. So the pediatric version. So like my, you know, hopefully my sister doesn't mind sharing this, but this has been an issue for my niece. She's five. Um, you know, and at first we always, we would always be like, oh, she just like is having too much fun and she doesn't want to stop to go potty. Mm -hmm. Right. Like she's, you know, or, but I'm like, I don't think her body's telling her when she has to go potty. When I started learning about my pelvic floor, <laughs> my grown up pelvic floor, you know, I was like, I'm wondering if she's, you know, if her body is not telling her brain that, oh, actually it's time to go potty until it's too late. Right. So, um, I'm curious, what are some of the things that are, you see are issues with the pediatric population? Yes. So before we dive in into the pediatric, uh, this is just my observation. I just recently started getting into pediatric pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. uh, I always love ped. And now that I have a good team for my woman center, I, I felt like the need to add Moms in here, we hear from moms talking about their kids, constipation, bad wedding, all those stuff. Mm -hmm. And I feel like moms are here. So how about we add the pediatric and just make it a center for mom and their babies? But I think same thing we are doing or we've been doing with woman health and normalizing things. We are doing the same thing with pediatric pelvic floor and just say, oh, they're still too young. Oh, she's going to grow out of it. I mean, I've heard from a pediatric side with a bad wedding, like, oh, she's not going to grow up and go to the university with a diaper on. So don't worry about her. And um, I feel like, no, that's not okay. Uh, yes, they are little, but that five years old, she is going to feel a little bit of embarrassment or maybe a lot, I don't know, or be ashamed of, oh, now my mom has to change my bed again. I'm wet or they feel uncomfortable. If it happens at school, that brings a lot of unwanted, you know, embarrassment and emotion with it that they are be young enough that they might not be comfortable expressing it or talking about it. So this is as important as normalize, not normalizing stuff with the woman health. 
Um, the common issue that causes a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction for kids is constipation. So mm -hmm. if, when we are treating someone for bedwetting, we always treat, we always find out that they are constipated. And then when you're treating the constipation, the bedwetting gets a lot better and then we can train the bladder. So anybody with a bladder dysfunction, we always treat the bowel because I, I just found, we just, we just see it in every kid that every kid is just uh, constipated un unless proven that they're not. But most of the time they are. And a lot of it is the diet, the, the juice, the, a lot of milk, a lot of, um, you know, sugar. So those are, and like you said, busy, too busy to go use the bathroom or when they feel the urge to go poop, they don't go. Mm -hmm. And with the poop sitting in the system cause a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction that affects bowel and bladder. So mm -hmm. the biggest thing I want to say with Pete is constipation. So if you get the constipation under control, everything else will get a lot easier result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's actually the, exactly what we did with Jassy is we, she was really backed up and she had to do a little cleanse and um, it made, it made a big difference for her mm -hmm. too. So yeah, the, those went, I can confirm anecdotally, those went hand yes. in hand for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, so far what I'm seeing, everybody come in with bedwetting and I treat their constipation. And so I, that this is the way to go. We have to treat the constipation because that full rectum just put pressure into the bladder area and cause the bladder to be irritated. Uh, or if it's full, that's an extra pressure that will cause kids to leak or um, completely lose their bladder control. Mm -hmm. Isn't um, breathing dysfunction, like the way that you breathe, also affect pelvic floor and the the bladder as well right because if you tend to chest breathe or shallow breathe you're not using so much the diaphragm and that can affect the pelvic floor as well 100 percent. so your diaphragm and pelvic floor they work together they mirror each other so the uh, the diaphragm on top and the pelvic in the pelvic floor and the bottom they work together when you breathe in your diaphragm should goes down and that cause your pelvic floor to go down and relax and then when you exhale the, the pelvic floor activates and these just moves together mm -hmm. if you're a chest breather so you're only breathing top your diaphragm is not dropping down it means everything else below your diaphragm is going to be on vacation so nothing is really doing anything not working so um as you mentioned diaphragmic breathing is number one thing we we address with our pelvic floor patients to get that breathing, get that system, that core system going. That's why we always say um, Kegel, it's not pelvic floor, it's more than a Kegel. There are times that we don't even do a Kegel uh, with our patients because pelvic floor muscle, it's uh, automatically knows what it what to do. If the system is in a homeostasis and knew it, doing what it's supposed to do, then there's no need for a Kegel. Unless mm -hmm. there's a significant amount of weakness, trauma, something that the muscle is super, super, super weak, then, you know, we do incorporate some pelvic floor activation. But yeah, like you said, if you get that, that breathing, you know, checked and mm -hmm. optimize the diaphragmic breathing, the pelvic floor will start working um, better and more effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard a lot of women... Um, when they're stressed, they kind of clench their vagina in and like tense their pelvic floor. And I know that I've actually had this problem and I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm feeling shy there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, or like for me, that's my, that was my problem when I, I'm all, I was always too tight. My, like anytime anybody see me, they're like, you need to relax. I'm like, I am relaxing. And they're like, oh, honey, like, <laughs> yeah. like they're like, no further. I'm like, okay. Like I have to like re relax harder. Right. <laughs> yeah. You, you gotta just work on some, some of those mm -hmm. deep diaphragmic breathing and let it go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So letting it go is a lot more of an issue for me than it was you know, what I would have thought of like, you know, that the Kegel idea or anything like that. And what's interesting. So, right. So you are here, diaphragm and, you know, pelvic floor. And then for us, we're actually, you know, tongue breathing in the diaphragm here. So you guys are kind of the diaphragm to the bottom and we're diaphragm to the top and they're all three connected. So it all has to work as a functional unit. Exactly. Although we have diaphragm and pelvic floor, we also work with jaw and pelvic mm -hmm. floor because those yep. are related. So if somebody is a 
um, jaw clincher, we always work on releasing the masseters, all the muscle in the face to help them relax their pelvic floor. So we do work with the jaw all the way to pelvic floor, because like you said, these are all connected. Whatever happens in your jaw actually happens in your pelvic floor. So people with overactive pelvic floor, I always ask them, do you have a tight jaw? Do you have neck pain? And sure enough, most of the time they're like, oh, yes, I do. I was like, yeah, because I, I haven't even examined you, but I can tell that mm -hmm. your pelvic floor, it's not weak. It's just overactive. It's really tense. It's really tight. And um, tightness is not always good. And tightness means tension. And unless we release that tension, then nothing in the system is going to really do what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what prolapse is? Yes. And then also, you know, a lot of times, right? So I've had <clears throat> several girlfriends. We all like drink the same water and had babies very close together. Um, and some have had issues with prolapse and basically are like, well, I think probably surgery is your only option. I'm like, and I'm, you know, me being like the holistic crunchy one. I'm like, wait a second. There's got to be other options. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's figure this out together. So tell us a little bit more about like, because I'm the opposite, right? I'm like, Ugh! and there is. Mm. <laughs> right. I mean, somebody could be both. Mm, and, mm, so that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, so um, the prolapse, it's when we have our internal organs coming down into the vaginal canal. Uh, it could be either the bladder, the uterus, or sometimes the rectum will come into the vaginal area. So some of it, funny enough, is it could be the tightness into the pelvic floor. So pelvic floor muscles are, a, it looks like a hammock. It looks like a bowl at the bottom of your pelvis that mm. support your internal organ. So if these muscles are tight, then they can generate enough force to support those organs. And that will cause, um, what I call it, it's just a tension weakness cycle. So the tightness in the muscle will cause the weakness in the system and things start coming down because the muscles are not really doing what they're supposed to do. So that prolapse patient that comes in, we always work on lengthening. And they're like, no, no lengthening. We wanna just strengthen things and keep everything in. And for me to be able to really work on a muscle getting stronger, I have to create that lend to the you know tension ratio so if something is shortened that could only activate so much but if i give it a good length into the muscles and that muscle has a stronger power to activate so always comes lengthening relaxing before activation and that's when we really could see the progress faster if we work on stretching softening relaxation of the pelvic floor even if we, we are dealing with weakness with the prolapse that we want to get those muscles stronger for a better stabilization, we always work on lengthening. So those people, they do have tension that, and you know, over time becomes a weakness. So mm -hmm. like I said, organs coming down and causing the vaginal pressure, moms or women complains of uh, feeling a golf ball in the vaginal opening. They feel like tampons um, there, but in reality, nothing is there. It's just an mm -hmm. organ pushing it vaginal area and um prolapse has the four different grading depending on what grade we have the prolapse yes surgery may be the only options but why not have conservative treatment first and make sure that this route failed before we go into something more um uh, invasive mm. and plus study shows that if you go in into any surgery, so this is not just pelvic floor, if you go in to a surgery with a strong muscle, your recovery will be a lot easier and a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So if we, and if somebody needs surgery to correct their prolapse, how about we rehabilitate these muscles? How about we teach this patient how to connect with their pelvic floor before surgery, before trauma, so when they are out of the surgery, now they already know how to take care of their pelvic floor when the doctor cleared them to go back to normal, okay? So having that connection, building that strength into the muscle will set them up for a better uh, outcome with the surgery and faster recovery. So mm -hmm. I, I'm always- Same even thing with tongue ties. <laughs> uh-huh. If surgery is the only option, we could still help this woman or this person by rehabilitating before the surgery and getting their muscles stronger. So after the surgery, it's 
it's not completely something new they're learning. They already had some muscle memory built up before the surgery. Mm -hmm. So yeah. important. That is literally the same principles we use for tongue type surgery preps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because so it works. It works. Parallels. Yes, it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. So what would be, I mean, I know we've kind of talked postpartum, we've talked some other things, but what would be somebody who hasn't had like a postpartum body and struggling? What were some of the signs or things that they might struggle with who, you know, hasn't been postpartum or pregnant? What are some other non-pregnancy related pelvic floor issues? So DRA or diastasis recti, although we see a lot of it in pregnancy and postpartum, but you, you can't have that without ever being pregnant or being a woman. So that's one issue that anybody could have a DRA, that separation in abdominal muscle, um, sexual dysfunction, regardless of male or female, that's another pelvic floor dysfunction we treat, pain with intercourse, um, mm -hmm. Funny thing is like, I have a daughter who is seven and she's getting close to having, you know, nine or 10 at half her cycle. And I'm starting to dig in a little bit more about how to educate my girl, how to have her be ready for this event. And I realize like they're going to have education at school and they're going to be taught that, hey, sex for the first few times, it's going to hurt. So we are putting that emotion into their brain, that pain is going to hurt that sorry sex is going to hurt and this is normal normalizing it from the time they are you know um i don't know 10 11 whenever that training happens and then these people are the one that are going to go start having a sexual relationship and if it hurts they're going to think it's normal they're never going to seek any treatment because we just told them it's normal. So pain with intercourse is something we see in a lot of young women that they finally, when they are in um, their 20s and 30s, they're just like, oh, it's always hurt. When I put a tampon, it always hurt, and I thought it's normal. So pain with intercourse is something that we see a lot of uh, with people who have never been pregnant or you know postpartum. What else we treat? Um, Valvaginia, when they have pain, um, neurological issue, nerve stuff going on. That's another, again, pain with intercourse um, sort of thing. I'm trying to think what else we treat since we're so focused on pregnancy postpartum. Uh, but yeah, again, hip pain, hip, uh, back pain, those are all the things that the muscles of the pelvic floor could be the cause of that hip pain or cause of that back pain. Sciatica, hey, those deep rotator muscles, they are interconnected with your pelvic floor muscles. So you might need to have, if your back pain is never, it's never, you know, been able to resolve it with different treatment, it, the cause might be in your pelvic floor. So back pain, hip pain, um, those are all the other stuff that we treat that, that is not specifically just for pregnancy and postpartum. Mm. All right, let's, let's get dirty. Let's talk about sex here. Yeah. Um, so if someone has pain with sex, is it generally in the vagina or is it like the muscles of the pelvic floor? Because usually it's like that initial insertion that hurts the worst. Um, what is what's going on there? What's going on there? So there could be a few reasons behind pain with intercourse. One, how are we connecting with our uh, partner? Um, do we get aroused by the partner because if you don't and then we're not going to have enough libido not going to have the sex hormones lubricating things and obviously those tissue is not going to be happy if we're not really into our partner so first of all just if there is tension in the relationship if we're not connected with our partner that could be a cause of pain with intercourse if that's not an issue then we have to look into the pelvic floor pelvic floor has three layers the first one, which is the most outer layer, that's responsible for um, sexual function and continence. Mm -hmm. A lot of time, this first layer could be the cause any spasm, lack of mobility, lack of flexibility in these muscles could cause pain with intercourse. Like you said, that initial um, penetration could be painful because this first layer of muscles are being tight and tense and spasm. And sometimes there are 
it could be caused by trauma. Uh, sometimes there's no reason for it. It's just the muscle um, that involuntarily spells them down, a condition we call vaginismus. And then we also have um, nerve issues that could be, again, injury, tightness, causing compression on the nerve that causing the pain in the area. Or we also have the second and third layer into a pelvic floor that are deeper into the muscle. So people who call, who have pain with deep penetration, maybe these layer of muscles are uh, dysfunctional. So when you get tight neck muscle, you have trigger points, you have, um, I don't know, not in your muscle. These muscle also could have um, trigger points or have a knot in these muscles, lack of mobility, lack of uh, flexibility, that could be causing the pain with intercourse. Hmm. Um, and then hormones. If it's if it's someone postpartum, if it's someone premenopausal, postmenopausal, and hormones, they don't have enough estrogen, the tissue gets thinner, more fragile. So that could also be another reason for painful intercourse. Does something like a vibrator help to like relax those muscles first if you are struggling with pain with intercourse or is it something where you would need more manual soft manipulation first? So I would always say there's a lot of gadget out there that, you know, it's advertised for this and that and it can help with your sexual life or pain with penetration. I always say have an assessment done. Okay, go to your professional, let them assess you, let them tell you, is it the first layer or is it the second layer? So learn about your pelvic floor, know the source of the pain, um, have an OB appointment, have some testing done, make sure there's no infection, there's no um, other underlying condition before you go for the over-counter and start treating yourself, right? Dr. Google could be good at the time, <laughs> but most of the time we get the wrong uh, the wrong answer to the question. So always have that assessment done. And then yes, um, if, if it's something, I mean, when we treat our patient, we only see them once a week, right? Mm -hmm. And we are just providing them the guidance of how to take care of themselves. And what we do is all about empowering women uh, or moms or, you know, in general, um, the clients to know how to take care of this issue at home that's when mm -hmm. tools comes in they come in we find all the area that needs to be treated and then we will use and teach them how to use that pelvic wand or vibrator or whatever we recommend for them to start with sometimes these could be a nerve issue and if you go in there with a vibrator you're just really upsetting that nerve and might even give you more issue rather than relaxation so we got to be gentle and respectful of the tissue and know what the tissue wants from us um so yeah the vibrator could help or it could make things worse if you don't uh if you never had a proper uh examination and knowing what is the cause of your uh, issue mm. So interesting. I've had so many girlfriends over the years, you know, going through my 20s and 30s where they really don't enjoy sex. And I think some of that is because the some of it's the guys, they're a little bit too gung ho, just trying to get in there really quick. Um, right. But a lot of it is like they don't know how to like ask for things or they don't know how to advocate for like what they like. Um, so I think that's a big part of of that whole piece of the puzzle too. It's just like taking a little bit of time, warming up a little and just going a little bit slower than you think. Cause you watch movies and it's just boom in the bedroom and you're going. Yes. No, um, definitely have that open conversation with a partner and let him know what you like, what you don't like. Uh, we can't really assume that they, they know because every person is different. Mm -hmm. Um, so always have that open communication if something doesn't give you pleasure. So I don't know, talk to your partner and maybe there's something else you could, you guys could do that you both enjoy. And like you say, uh, you can't just, you have to prepare the tissue. You can't just be like, okay, let's go in and get it going. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of uh, foreplay, um, a lot of time for the tissue to relax, a lot of time for that libido to come and, um, you know, lubricate. We may need lubrications um, based on our hormone level. So there's no shame in that game. Um, just open communication and just know what you what your body needs. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 It is interesting. Um, 
what you were saying, Kimmy. And then also just interesting too, just how much like, I feel like before I had a baby, I definitely did not know my body as well as I do post having a baby. So like, <laughs> because everything goes out the window when you have a baby. Um, and so I do think that's like, it's such a part of the important conversations, especially those who haven't had or younger or, you know, like I didn't learn about my period until I had it. Right. Um, and I wish I would have known about it sooner. And I wish it was conversations that we had and, you know, I'm going to learn lots and lots to have conversations with my daughter. So, um, I love the idea of just empowering people to know their bodies and, you know, being able to make those connections and take, take good care of ourselves and nothing has to be embarrassing. Our health isn't embarrassing. Taking care of ourselves isn't embarrassing. Right. Um, and I think that's a big thing. That's a big help we have to like kind of accept and move through. Yes, definitely. And just know your body is going to be different in every stage of your life. You just have to learn how to connect with this new body and just self-care and love your, you know, your abilities in this phase of your life. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that should be the title of the episode. (laughs) There we go. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody says post pre-pregnancy body. I was like, forget about that. Just enjoy this new body. The new body Mm -hmm. that gave birth to this a human being that your life is now just, you know, connected to this little being that everything you do, it just revolves around their needs. Mm-hmm. So let go of the path and let's just move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely had a lot of hard body talks with myself growing up and just like, you know, my body was a lot different than everybody else's. And I got like boobs early and all those things. And so you know, for me, I never loved my body. And that's been a real struggle for me. And it's been something I've really had to like work on my like mental game with and talking to myself about because my body created the world's most perfect human. um, And I love her so much. And without her, I don't like I feel like she's an extension of my body, right. Mm -hmm. And so my views on my body have changed a lot. Um, You know, obviously, I want to keep working with my my girl, Julie. Um, on getting the sciatica under control and some of these like back stuff and some of my other body things that we've been working through since having my sweet baby child. Um, Mm -hmm. But I definitely view my body a lot differently in the last couple of years than I did um, previously. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so true. And even like on the opposite side, like every single person I think has like body issues at some level and then the ones that don't we all think are kind of weird like I love the Real Housewives of Salt Lake but Lisa Barlow is always like I love myself like I love myself and she starts crying and it's just like (laughs) I'm not sure if I've ever felt it that deeply (laughs) but you should but we're supposed to we're supposed to we're supposed to and but yeah (laughs) I know we do we really need to like you need to I actually have a sticky note um that like I have had to write for myself like you and this is not totally about my body but in general like you have to believe in yourself as much as you believe in everybody else right like my personality is being everybody else's like biggest cheerleader and thinking that they can like shoot from the moon stars and all in everything in between mm-hmm. win the olympic gold at everything they possibly can do and so why why shouldn't I believe that about myself too mm-hmm. right and so that's been something this last year in particular I've been doing inner work on Mm-hmm. um as well because like we should we should love our bodies right if we you know we love all of the people in our lives like why shouldn't we love ourselves just as much so mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. very true that's, thanks I mean, for that's, sharing Megan oh yeah of course you know me I love to share my <laughs> so actually what's funny is my affirmator today that I pulled this morning for myself was vulnerability um mm-hmm. <laughs> So I allow myself to talk about my feelings without fear of external judgment or internal drama. When I express my feelings, a couple of funny things happen. I feel like a kindergartner and everything gets lighter, easier, and filled with comforting glow of honesty. Hey, no wonder kindergartners seem so fun, glowy, and free. So, you know, my own personal affirmator also uh, gets into this uh, <laughs> episode today. <laughs> but it's, it's good. I, I mean, everybody has the same feelings. Everybody has like you know, relatively the same body, different mm-hmm. issues, same body, right? Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, I have one more question I'm dying to ask you as the vagina dog. All right. How common is it for women to not have an orgasm? 
very common. Uh, so I don't have a percentage for you, but based on what I see here and the conversation we have. So when we are treating a lot of time, uh, when we are so postpartum moms, it's a lot harder for them to have an orgasm because of the mm. hormonal changes. Um, or they have an orgasm, but it's not as strong anymore. So one mm. of it is just they're tired. Number two, the hormones. Number three, they don't have enough time for foreplay. So they're just, they never get aroused to the point that they are going to have an orgasm. Mm. So uh, we just, I just reassure them that this is temporarily but do not give up an orgasm. Um, and um, it's, it's just a phase of life. If you can have that extra time for, for play, if you can have extra time to rest and take care of yourself, those are everything that's going to affect your sex life. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of it with postpartum moms and then people with overactive bladder, bladder a lot of tightness, less blood flow to the clitoris, not enough um, stimulation and... Um, one thing I noticed with some of my vaginus misfation or people who have difficulty with penetration and sexual, you know, uh, intercourse is that because they've never, they've never been able to have penetration um, and they had difficulty connecting with this part of their body, um, they are happy with the least like, okay, finally, I can have penetration. I don't care about the orgasm. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's by itself, it's a dysfunction and we treat, <clears throat> and that's something that women um, might not think it's as important as that pleasuring your partner, being able to give them what they want, the penetration. Uh, but yes, um, I don't have a percentage, but I mm -hmm. see it a lot in our practice that women have difficulty or with an orgasm. Yeah. I know that like me personally, um, I had a lot of shame around that part of my body just the way I grew up I just felt very shame when I was a kid if they talk about it I go la 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 <laughs> just like yes. want to block it out I actually never had one until I was like really close to 30 okay and so it's been an interesting um journey you know because it was like I would always call my good friends and I'm like what does it feel like like what it, what is this like I'm right. googling like how do you know if you've had one? But if you've had one, you know. You would know. You know. Yes. You know. Um, what what would you uh, suggest, like, from a doctor's point of view on, like, women who feel like they haven't really had that? Like, what hope would you give them? There's a reason for it. So they just, they just need to find a reason and treat it, and then they're going to have the best time of their life with their partner, I don't know when people say, no, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Not having it. It's like, girl, you don't know what you're missing out. Okay. No. <laughs> so don't give up on this. There is a reason behind it. And it's, it's either hormone or tension or lack of, and you know, blood flow to the area when you, we got to get to the bottom of it. And um, definitely it is treatable. So the help is there. Uh, talk to a provider, see a public floor PT, and yeah, don't give up. It's it's treatable. Thank you so much for sharing. It's nice to like hear it from your perspective, you know. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Oh, so many things today. We have to cover it all. And I, I love it. I love getting like being able to talk about getting to know our bodies. Um, you know, and again, part of why we did this episode is because our bodies are all connected, right? We already like made several connections between pelvic floor and jaw the tongue position and the diaphragm and the diaphragm to the pelvic floor. Like if our body is off in one area, it's going to be off somewhere else. And so sometimes we have to keep peeling back those layers and going through different things to figure out what the root cause of these problems are. Right. Cause none of us are meant to be in pain. Like we're just not, that shouldn't be our baseline. And so whatever that looks like to get us out of pain, maybe sometimes we have to think outside the box or see a different specialist. Like, I think that is so, so, so important. So thank you so much, oh, Dr. Linda, for joining us today. Um, you know, and kind of what we were talking about earlier with the self-love stuff, you guys, that's exactly what we're talking about and like really diving into at our retreat. 
in the Dominican Republic, November 9th through 12th. That is a big part of what we are going to do because if you're trying to build businesses, you're trying to build like the next phase of your life and you are like, you don't love yourself or you have your own issues to work through. Like you're going to run into those walls and those limiting beliefs. So Mm -hmm. we would love to chat with you more about that. Of course, you guys can find more information on our, our retreat on our websites and our social medias. And Dr. Linda, if people want to find you on social media, remind them what your Instagram handle is. How can they find you? Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. Like I said, my mission is bigger than Femino, bigger than Pasadena. And now we are on your podcast just talking to every woman or every human about the pelvic floor. And if somebody wants to follow us, uh, we do have a lot of information on pelvic floor, some educational, some fun stuff. So it's not a boring I think we're not boring, uh, <laughs> but yes. So it's uh, the underscore letter we were for victory underscore doc, D-O-C, the we doc, and, um, or just search my clinic name, feminocentric, any of those things will pop up and we would love to have everyone join us in our platform. Yeah, love it. And of course, if you guys want to find us, you can find us at the Munch Bunch podcast. You can find Kimmy at Mouth Muscle Memory and you can find me at NWMFT. Thank you for joining us on this Munchy Monday. Um, we hope that you guys go into the week be loving your imperfections and being vulnerable. Bye. 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 We have a special offer for our Munch Bunch listeners. To book a virtual consult with Megan, she's offering a discount of $25 off. Just email her, Megan, at nwmyofunctionaltherapy.com or through her website, www.orofacial-myology.com. To book a virtual consult with Kimmy for the $25 off, email her mouthmusclememory at outlook.com or through the website www.mouthmusclememory.com. 